admittedly, you know, some of my older colleagues were like, this is crazy. This can't be, you know, we should, you know, be, be very, very, very cautious and conservative about, you know, saying this. Hello, everyone, and welcome to what's the third episode of A Night with a Space Nobelist series. My name is Tommi Tenkanen, and I am the host of this series. In today's episode, we have Professor Adam Rees as our guest. Professor Rees is a cosmologist. He works at the Johns Hopkins University and the Space Telescope Science Institute in the US. He received the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics, together with his colleagues Saul Perlmutter and Brian B. Schmidt, for the discovery of accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. Hello, Professor Rees. How are you? Good. Welcome to a night with the Space Nobelists. We are very glad and honored to have you with us today. You do, ex uh, you do research on the expansion of the universe, but what does that mean? Could you uh, let us know what does the expansion of the universe mean? Yeah, this is really uh, an empirical observation that goes back almost 100 years uh, to uh, the fact that when we look at galaxies around us, they appear to be moving away from us. That is, their light is red shifted. Uh, but unlike the Doppler effect, which you may be familiar with when a uh, an object uh, is moving away from you and emits sound or light that uh, is also redshifted. In this case, it's true of all the galaxies around us. And uh, because we know we're not in a special place or we're not special creatures, we recognize it. it is really a consequence of the universe expanding, that wherever you are in an expanding universe, everything will look like it's moving away from you. And then, of course, it's very interesting to measure how fast the universe is expanding. It can tell us about how old the universe is. Uh, and the other part of my work is to look back in time uh, and measure how fast it was expanding in the past, compare that to the present, and learn about changes in the expansion rate. And how do you do that? Yeah, so uh, generally we look for objects in the universe that we understand well. Uh, and we might use their brightness to tell us how far away they are. Uh, and we may take their spectrum or look at their colors to tell us uh, how much of the redshift has occurred. Right. And what is causing this expansion then? Why is the universe ex is why right. is the so universe expanding? Initially, the universe was expanding after the Big Bang, after a period known as inflation. Um, and uh, after that, we might have expected the expansion to slow down because of the attractive gravity of all the objects in the universe. But uh, more recently, uh, it appears that there's this kind of repulsive gravity in the universe called dark energy that seems to be accelerating the expansion of the universe. This is what we actually won the Nobel Prize for, uh, discovering that the uh, expansion rate has been speeding up. We looked at the light of distant exploding stars called supernovae uh, and compared those to nearby ones and determined that the uh, expansion has been speeding up, that distances have been growing uh, faster over time uh, than you would have expected if uh, this was not going on, if the universe was just coasting or even decelerating. And was there the surprise when you learned that? Uh, it was to me, <laughs> um, you know, what I had learned in graduate school up until that time was uh, that uh, there was a debate about whether the universe had a lot of matter or a little matter uh, and whether the uh, expansion was slowing down only a little or a lot. Uh, it wasn't something I expected uh, to see it was actually speeding up the opposite. So it was really quite a surprise. And um, how was it for you as a young scientist learning such a thing, making such a discovery? Uh, how was it taken? Right. Well, you know, it was it was certainly exciting. It was tremendous. Uh, I mean, this is exactly what you want to do as a scientist is to you know work on things that are quite interesting. Um, I, I guess I would say the fact that I was a uh, uh, very young at the time I was you know 27, 28, um, man, I did not have a lot of perspective 
uh, about cosmology and really in some ways about how unusual or unexpected this was, uh, I think in some ways it was an advantage because, you know, I looked at the data, I looked at the measurements, I did, you know, tests with my colleagues to make sure they were uh, correct or as correct as we could tell, rigorous. Uh, and then I felt fairly at ease uh, by, you know, presenting the results. Whereas, admittedly, you know, some of my older colleagues were like, this is crazy. This can't be, you know, we should, you know, be be very, very, very cautious and conservative about, you know, saying this. And uh, so, you know, maybe that was that was one kind of interesting difference. And what made them convinced of your results that they were, in fact, well, correct? Well, you know, first... In, internally, we continued to do checks and cross checks and decided, you know, at some level, the only intellectually honest uh, thing to do as a scientist is to report your results, even if ultimately, you know, you're not totally sure if the true consequence they imply is correct. Uh, and then over the course of a few years, new ways of looking at the universe through the cosmic microwave background really confirm this picture that the universe is about 70% in the form of dark energy and about 30% in the form of matter. So, you know, ultimately it is by other experiments that we come to gain confidence in results like this one. So you mentioned dark energy. Do we know what it is? And can you also tell us how is it related to the expansion of the universe? So we have this, this basic idea that in many ways comes to us from Einstein, that uh, in his theory of gravity called general relativity, gravity can be attractive or repulsive and that there's uh, a sort of you know mechanism or way that uh, empty space if it has energy in it will give rise to this repulsive gravity in general relativity um, einstein invoked it at one time to perhaps figure out how the universe could be static if it wasn't uh, expanding or contracting uh, we generally call this phenomenon dark energy the uh, the energy of empty space However, we really struggle to understand, you know, in in real detail how it works uh, and how much there should be and how strong it should be. So anything that is specific and quantitative really breaks down when we try to uh, deal in specifics with dark energy. However, it seems to be the most likely explanation for why the universe is accelerating. It would naturally do that. Uh, and so, you know, there's a there's a tension now between understanding it theoretically and just going out and measuring what it does to the universe and understanding it that way. Hopefully, eventually the two sort of ways come together. And is that what you do research on at the moment? Yeah. So what I've been working on more recently is really refining much more precisely the absolute value of today's expansion rate. So it's possible to tell that the universe is accelerating just by making relative measurements. So you compare how fast then to how fast now, and uh, that doesn't require you to know it in absolute terms. It would be like saying you have a car that you're traveling in and you could speed up in the car and you could know that even without, without knowing whether your speedometer is accurate in an absolute sense. You know, you sped up 10 or 20%, but how fast are you actually going? Um, I've been working in the last you know, 10 years or so on getting that absolute number correct because it has the ability to uh, allow us to test our whole understanding of the universe because uh, shortly after the Big Bang, we also get a very powerful absolute calibration of how fast the universe was expanding. And if we understand the cosmological model, if we understand the physics of the universe, we can use that early measurement to predict how fast the universe should be expanding today. And so uh, this is a very interesting area most recently because uh, they don't seem to agree and uh, may be indicating that we're still missing something interesting about the universe. So it's a very topical research topic at the moment. Yes, yeah. it is. It is. It's, it goes by the name of the Hubble constant tension, uh, although uh, you know one could give it other names. Uh, but it's it's the the idea or the you know the observation that the number that we call the Hubble constant, which is the rate at which the universe expands today, uh, when we measure it very carefully, it seems to not agree with the value predicted from the early universe. And so it's possible that there's some other element 
uh, in the cosmological model that might explain uh, what's going on. What do you think is the biggest unanswered question in cosmology? Is that exactly that or something else? Right. Um, I think the biggest unanswered question in cosmology has got to be at some level um, how to quantize gravity, how to relate the quantum mechanical world to the macroscopic or large scale world of general relativity um, and understanding how nature does that probably lies at the center of understanding dark energy. Now, the Hubble constant tension is more in the realm of a new or fresh clue or, or, or something interesting that may tell us something about that story. You know, we're desperate for clues, but you know, it's, it's unclear at the moment of, of exactly how to connect it. So I, you know, I would say in a contemporary sense, the Hubble constant tension is, is sort of the most interesting tell today of something, we don't quite know what, but the big questions are are clear. And those are the things we're really wrestling with, trying to get clues or, or make some progress on those. Is it surprising to you that by making observations of the largest scales in the universe, you can learn something about quantum mechanics that is a theory of the smallest scales in the universe? Yes, it's amazing. First of all, I thought you had to be smarter to do this. So, you know, just the fact that I can make measurements and observations uh, seems, you know, amazing to me. I thought, you know, you'd have to be Einstein sitting there and just, you know, thinking and doing thought experiments and pencil and paper. But, you know, it turns out that, of course, in science, you know, there's this full cycle, the scientific method, where you may go from theory and hypothesis, but ultimately there's so many possibilities that we have to go back to the universe and, and look at it and see what it's actually doing. And so um, it's remarkable that that full circle comes all the way around so that, you know, you can make measurements and observations. Um, but uh, that is the nature of cosmology. That's, you know, why it's such an exciting and interesting field is it connects from, you know, the macroscopic objects we see today to quantum fluctuations in the early universe. It's pretty amazing indeed. How did you end up studying this topic, the expansion of the universe? Um, you know, I, I, when I started graduate school, I knew almost nothing about this. And uh, I picked up a book that uh, we were assigned to read about the, you know, sort of everything we know in cosmology written by Frank Shu called like the physical universe or something. And when I read the chapter on the expansion of the universe, I just thought, this is so unbelievable. This is almost like science fiction, how the universe can be expanding. And I also thought it was so amazing. We don't really quite know yet how fast that was difficult to measure. If we knew how fast it could tell us how old the universe is, and that may or may not fit with some of the oldest objects in the universe. This sounded like the greatest mystery uh, you know, wrapped in the most interesting science. And I, I knew as soon as I read about it, I wanted to work on something related to that. And so, you know, then you go and you talk to a lot of people doing research at your school and see if anybody's working on this and, uh, you know, if you could help. And that's sort of how I got started working with uh, my advisor, Bob Kirshner, who was interested in the expansion of the universe. He was also interested in supernovae and uh, there was a uh, the potential to sort of interface the two. And that's sort of where I got in. Uh, did you ever consider studying something else? Um, sure. Uh, I was certainly interested in, in physics. I'm also quite interested in data and measurements and statistics. I, I certainly thought about uh, doing something that was very quantitative and analytical in biology uh, at one point. Then uh, I thought about it in terms of even uh, analyzing market data, you know, economic markets, things like that. Um, so uh, I thought about those things. I'm very interested in history. Um, so I thought about uh, maybe studying history. I ended up minoring in history in college. Uh, so lots of other things are quite interesting to me. What do you do on your typical day at work? Does such a thing even exist, a typical day at work? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, so I am usually, essentially, I've sort of charted a multi-year effort to make a sort of successive iteration of improved experiment and measurement on the expansion of the universe. And so I might be writing proposals to use the Hubble Space Telescope to get new data. 
Um, I might be analyzing some of that data. I might be working with students or postdocs who have analyzed some of that data. We might be having a group meeting. I might be preparing to give a talk at a meeting. I teach uh, undergraduate class to uh, Johns Hopkins University students. So I teach a kind of general intro to astronomy. I also work on calibrating the Hubble Space Telescope at the Space Telescope Science Institute. So I might be involved in a calibration project. Um, lots of different uh, things. I might be refereeing a paper that another colleague wrote. Um, you know, there are all kinds of uh, jobs one does uh, as a scientist. Uh, but, you know, the best jobs are still the ones that, that get right at the focus of the science that I'm trying to do, the, the projects, the experiments. So, you know, for me, many things are sort of, you know, eating your vegetables to, to sort of get to dessert. So let's now talk a little bit about your Nobel Prize. You received your Nobel Prize back in 2011. Has it changed your life in some way, receiving a Nobel Prize? Yeah, I mean, it, it, surely it has changed my life in, in, uh, in many ways. I would say I spend a lot of time trying to not have it change my life, um, if, if that makes any sense. Um, when I won the Nobel Prize, uh, I mean, I did the research when I was 27, 28. I won the Nobel Prize, I was 41, uh, and uh, I wasn't ready to be done doing research. And yet, if you don't hold on very strongly to your, your daily hours and your sort of research work that's important, to you, then um, it will quickly be eaten up and taken away in uh, other activities, which could be fun and interesting and inspiring and, and have other sort of attributes. But I guess my thought was, you know, once you leave the research world, you'll never go back uh, in some ways. And I, as I said, I was too young and too much enjoying uh, actually, you know, what I had been trained to study, cosmology. So, uh, you know, I've tried really hard to stay active in doing research. I mean, I still do a lot of interesting things that relate to the Nobel Prize, interesting, you know, talks like this one we're doing now, uh, in different fora uh, that are, you know, quite fun and interesting. Um, things that I would not have had a chance to do before, people I've gotten to meet that I wouldn't have met before. Um, you know, I'm asked for my opinion about things that I don't know a lot about, and I try to be careful not to, you know, pontificate about things I don't know that much about. Uh, sometimes people think because you have a Nobel Prize, you will know the answers to all kinds of things. You will be, you know, super wise in all things. And I, you know, that's not what the Nobel Prize is for. It's not awarded for being, you know, exceptionally wise. It's usually awarded for a discovery. Um, and so I try to keep that in mind and kind of focus on, you know, what got me into this, which is trying to understand aspects of the universe. So, Professor Ries, can you tell us how was the Nobel ceremony like back in 2011 when you got your Nobel Prize? Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, I, I always joke about various things like they don't teach you this in graduate school. And it's definitely one of those they don't teach you this in graduate school moments. I mean, it's so unlike anything else uh, that ever happens. It's sort of like in the US, we have a, a, a big award ceremony for people in the movies called the Academy Awards. It, it's sort of like some like taking a bunch of scientists and bringing them to the Academy Awards. It's very fancy and uh, it's you know very exotic and uh, you know so many people pay attention to it. And it's, it's really the opposite of daily science where there's really very little pomp and circumstance, uh, very little ceremony. So it's, you know, it's definitely a once in a lifetime experience. And uh, when I was clearing customs uh, in the U.S. coming back from the Nobel, you know, we were very tired. It had been 10 days of celebrations. I was with my wife, uh, Nancy, and, uh, you know, the, the customs agent who sort of it was being very serious and, uh, you know, never broke a smile or anything. You know, he was looking at, my, you know, our materials and, you know, he's looking at my passport and, and, you know, he said, uh, okay, you know, what, what were you doing there? And you know, I was like, well, you know, I was in uh, Sweden to pick up the Nobel prize. And, you know, he looked at the prize and again, very, just very direct. And then, you know, while he's looking at this, he, he looks over at my wife, Nancy, and he says, see, Nancy, you thought he'd never amount to anything. 
And uh, anyway, it was just very, it was just a very funny, sarcastic uh, uh, joke, just when I thought that he wasn't even following the story. Uh, but uh, anyway, but it was, uh, yeah, it was um, fun. Now, Professor Rees, I would like to ask you a few questions our audience has suggested us. Vilma is asking, does the universe have a center? Right. Um, in our understanding of the expanding universe, there is no unique center. Um, in fact, we think that everywhere is more or less the same as everywhere else. Everything is rushing away from everything. And so there's really no unique center. Next, Artu is asking, would it be possible to utilize dark energy in some way? Yeah, I wish that it was. Uh, unfortunately, dark energy is very, very weak. That's why we didn't even discover it until we could add it up across, you know, intergalactic space. And so you might think of it that way as just incredibly weak, weaker than almost any, you know, any other kind of energy that we use. And we don't really know how to harness it. It only causes uh, things to have um, repulsive gravity. And so we don't really have any way to use it, the best use of it, I would say at this point, is following it and what it shows us to learn more about gravity and quantum mechanics and their interface. Because if we can understand that better, the deeper understanding of physics could have all kinds of applications, including technology. So it's not going to be possible to, say, charge your cell phone with dark energy? I don't think so. I don't think so. All right. And now that we are talking about dark energy, I must also ask you, is it related to dark matter? Um, you know, at face value, it doesn't look like it. It looks like dark matter is a kind of particle uh, that uh, has attractive gravity uh, and coalesces where there are other heavy objects, like in galaxies and clusters of galaxies, uh, much less so in the space between galaxies. Dark energy seems very smooth and uniform, more energy-like, not clumpy. And because of the consequences of general relativity, probably as a repulsive gravity. Uh, and we don't think the two are connected. However, there are some exotic theories in physics that do connect the two through interactions or uh, decays and things like that, that are, are intriguing and you know, ultimately, um, or another possibility is, you know, that we really don't understand gravity at some level and that uh, the ultimate theory of gravity will find, you know, dark matter and dark energy to be sort of epicycles of our current uh, understanding of gravity. Now, there's no reason to think that. There's no reason to not sort of accept at face value the dark matter and dark energy. But, you know, good science always sort of keeps those possibilities open until you know, we, we can actually, you know, wrestle dark matter to the ground in our laboratories uh, or the same with dark energy. So there are a lot of dark things in cosmology that we don't right. quite I understand. Mean, you know, it, it's just, it, it would be almost uh, egocentric for us to think that uh, everything should emit light that we humans can see. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's dark to us, but you know, we're really the exotic or strange thing in the universe. We're very unusual, made of our baryonic matter and on our planet that has water and <laughs> is very stable. And so, you know, we're sitting on this very strange perch looking out and saying, well, you know, why isn't everything visible to us just the way we're used to? And, you know, the answer is that's not what most of the universe is. We're actually the, the oddity in this case. And, uh, you know, we just have to do a lot of work, physics and otherwise, to come to understand what the universe actually mostly is. Uh, Professor Rees, we are very glad we have had you today with us. I have just one final question for you, which is that are there any tips you would like to give to students who wanted to do research on cosmology? Yeah, um, you know, I would say um, find the aspects that are interesting, that are fascinating to you and follow those. Don't worry about thinking about, you know, what it's likely to lead to, whether this is, you know, going to be important or, you know, winning a prize or something like that. Just find the parts that, you know, that are, you find compelling, that you can kind of connect to, that seem accessible and uh, work on those. And, you know, I think as long as you're 
motivated that that's really when you will do the best work. Thank you very much, Professor Rees. My pleasure. Been a great pleasure and honor having you with us today. Thank you. This was the third episode in the series A Night with the Space Nobelists. I hope you enjoyed watching it. Thank you and see you next time.